In order to make America great and glorious again, I am tonight announcing my candidacy for President of the United States. America's comeback starts right now. Well, it's official. Donald Trump is back and in the race to be America's next president. He made the announcement at his estate in Florida on Tuesday evening, and the crowd cheered just as they did back in 2015 when he first ran for president. But things are very different now. There's another big beast in the Republican Party, Ron DeSantis, and it's by no means clear that Don can beat Ron. We'll find out more about DeSantis in a moment, but first, let's hear a bit more from Trump's big announcement. Our country is in a horrible state. We're in grave trouble. This is not a task for a politician or a conventional candidate. This is a task for a great movement that embodies the courage, confidence, and the spirit of the American people. This is a movement. This is not for any one individual. We will make America glorious again. And we will make America great again. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank you. Well, Trump's message and slogans are very similar, aren't they, to when he ran back in 2015. But this time around, of course, he's got a very powerful younger rival for the party's nomination in Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida. DeSantis hasn't even said he's running yet, but just look at the latest poll. Just a few days before Trump's announcement, one poll showed that uh, DeSantis was ahead with Republicans and Republican-leaning voters on 42%, while Donald Trump just on 35%. And clearly, Trump is taking him pretty seriously and is already on the attack. He told Fox News, I don't know if he is running. I think if he runs, he could hurt himself very badly. I really believe he could hurt himself badly. Trump said, I think he would be making a mistake. I think the base would not like it. I don't think it would be good for the party. And not only that, earlier this month, Donald Trump gave DeSantis a nickname and not a very flattering one. There it is, Trump at 71, Ron DeSanctimonious at 10%. Well, we're going to bring in our guests very soon, including two ardent Republicans who have always supported Donald Trump, but do they now prefer DeSantis? We'll find out in a moment. But first, for those of you who don't know much about the Florida governor, here's a quick introduction. I have only begun to fight. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you for a historic landslide victory. This was a huge night for Ron DeSantis. The 44-year-old governor of Florida didn't just win re-election, he won it by a landslide, nearly 20 points ahead of his challenger. The scale of his victory has many people asking if he is about to make a run for the presidency next. He certainly has the profile. He's a graduate of Harvard and Yale and is an Iraq War veteran. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your governor speaking. Today's training evolution, dogfighting, taking on the corporate media. Never, ever back down from a fight. Dubbed Trump 2.0 or Trump Plus, it's easy to see where DeSantis gets his political inspiration. Hello, Pensacola. Ron loves playing with the kids. Build the wall. He reads stories. Then Mr. Trump said, you're fired. I love that part. He's teaching Madison to talk. Make America great again. While much of the country was locked down with COVID restrictions, Florida remained open throughout. DeSantis has declared himself an enemy of the so-called liberals and progressives in America. We fight the woke in the legislature. We fight the woke in the schools. We fight the woke in the corporations. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes to die. In his first term, he passed the so-called Anti-Woke Act that prevents the teaching of critical race theory in schools. And he even got into a fight with the Walt Disney Corporation. Breaking moments ago, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signing a law to end the private government Disney runs around its resort in Orlando after the company criticized a state law that critics call the Don't Say Gay Bill. Supporters say it's about protecting parental rights. He also ended sanctuary city status in the state of Florida and carried out one of the most controversial political stunts of the past few years. 
Dozens of apparent migrants landed by charter flight uh, on a rocky island in the Atlantic, Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. They arrived as part of what Governor Ron DeSantis calls a relocation program. Many did not know where they were going, and local officials on the island were not given any advance notice of the flight's arrival. He also earned plaudits for his hands-on response to Hurricane Ian, although his shiny white boots may have marked him down a couple of points. The green M&M, you will notice, is no longer wearing sexy boots. Now she's wearing sensible sneakers. Good news. We may have finally found a green M&M more up Tucker Carlson's alley. Hello there. Whatever liberal America thinks of him, it's clear Floridians love him. He won a shade under 60% of the vote in his re-election campaign. And so, as one of the great Republican successes of the midterms, Ron DeSantis has moved up to the heavyweight division and appears ready to challenge Donald Trump for the title. OK, let's bring in our guest now. And Jan Halper-Hayes is an ardent Trump supporter who served as an advisor to his campaign in the last election and hopes that he will win the nomination this time around, too. Greg Swenson is the chairman of Republicans Overseas, who also admires Trump but believes it is time the Republican Party moved on to Ron DeSantis. And finally, we have Anne Lickman, a professor of American history, who has correctly predicted the outcomes of all US presidential elections since 1984. Uh, welcome to the Nexus, all three of you. Uh, Jan, I'd like to start with you. I know you were watching the announcement. Let me ask you something, just a personal thing. Did you get the same thrill when President Trump announced his, he would be a candidate as you did in 2015? Uh, I don't remember necessarily getting a thrill as much as being relieved that a business person was going to go in in 2016. And I knew that this was coming. So um, I just stayed up to watch it in detail and then have some conversations with some people at Mar-a-Lago to get some other information. Inf but oh. I'm relieved. I would say I'm relieved. Any information you can share with us? Uh, no, I just wanted to know what was going on <laughs> and who else was there, et cetera. Right, OK. Um, are you not perturbed at all by the polls that suggest that uh, actually DeSantis is ahead of Trump? Well, it depends on which poll. That's number one. Number two is in US politics, uh, things can change tomorrow. Um, and so I think we're making a big deal about DeSantis mm. simply because he formalized that Florida is a red state. He has been a great governor and he is the model for other governors. I wish that some of the blue states would at least do okay. some of the things that he's now, done. Now, you see, of course, Trump's called him an average governor, and this is where the tearing down starts to begin, isn't it? Um, Greg, uh, you told us before the announcement that you think it's time for the Republicans to move on. Did Trump's announcement on Tuesday evening actually change your mind? No, but I was very impressed with the announcement. You know, he kept, he kept focused. He didn't talk about the 2020 election. He didn't get off you know, he didn't get off topic. I thought he made some points that were very true, that things were a lot better when he was president, and it's hard to argue that point at all. So, um, but I've been advocating for Ron DeSantis or even some of the other candidates, Mike Pompeo, Glenn Youngkin, you know, just because they're younger, for sure, they and they can serve two terms. So there, you know, there's other reasons besides liking one candidate over the other to support some of the other ones. So, and I, I also am just a little concerned that, that President Trump could, could be an electoral challenge, um, given what's, you know, what happened in the midterms, but even what happened in 2018 and 2020. That, that's not all on Trump, and I'm not arguing that it is, but, you know, reality is reality. And I think a, a, a fresh face would be good for the party and, and good for the country. Jan, just picking up on that point that Greg made, uh, you know, DeSantis is only 44. And, and Trump is well into his 70s. So two terms, potentially, for DeSantis if he does well, whereas there's always going to be a limit on, on Trump, of course. He's only got one more term in him, uh, if that. Well, one of my thoughts is that he should pick DeSantis as his VP so that when his term is up in 2028, it just really is a shoe in for DeSantis, for the Republicans to continue. Do you think it's too late for that, though? Do you think that Trump has torn DeSantis down and plans to do so even more in the future? Too much? Well, did you catch Trump's apology? I and mean, he never apologizes. He issued a formal apology for calling him Ron 
de sanctimonious. And enough of us have made it very clear to him that that kind of politicking, campaigning is not going to work in 2022. Yeah, that, that actually, that apology may be a first. Um, Alan, I know from your previous media appearances, you're not really a fan of either man, but if you were advising, uh, well, let's put it this way, if you were picking a candidate for the Republicans uh, to beat whoever it might be on the other side, probably Joe Biden, who would you pick? Well, I would pick neither, of course. But yeah. let me put this in, in historical perspective. My system, which has been right for 40 years, the keys to the White House, indicates that presidential elections probably turn on the strength and performance of the White House party. That's Joe Biden and his administration. And therefore, it doesn't matter in terms of who's going to win, whether Republicans pick Trump or DeSantis. The other thing that has struck me about both Trump and DeSantis is not the slightest bit of awareness of the deep problems within the Republican Party. Three disappointing elections in a row, 2018, 2020, 2022. And it's not just Trump, it's problems that run from top to bottom in the Republican Party, where two thirds, according to the exit poll, still embrace the lie that Biden was not legitimately elected. Here's the problem for Republicans. They have essentially abandoned everything they once professed to stand for. Personal responsibility, personal morality, gone in a party that embraces Donald Trump and Herschel Walker. Limited government, states' rights, gone in a party that advocates a nationwide abortion ban, which would be the most draconian imposition on the American people perhaps in history. Jeff? Respect for traditional institutions, a big chunk of the party abandoned the most sacred of our traditions, the peaceful transfer of power. Republican Party needs to do some rethinking, and so far I've seen no difference Jan, between DeSantis to... and Trump. It doesn't matter. Do you want to respond to that, Jan? Well, I actually agree with him uh, on one level, that the Republican Party is so dispersed. If if you had two pieces of paper and you had the Democrats and you had to write down what the different viewpoints um, opposing, you'd have a blank paper. If you go to the Republicans, we've got the Freedom Caucus, we've got the Never Trumpers, we've got the Uniparty, and we've got America First. So I think that what there is going to be is there needs to be a reckoning between basically the nationalists and the globalists, and I don't think that that is likely to happen anytime soon. Greg, just picking up on uh, Professor Lickman's point, uh, and he was saying there's really no difference between DeSantis or Trump uh, on those points that he said, which is bringing the party back to its traditional uh, values. Do you think that's true? Well, I, I don't think so. I mean, Ron DeSantis has done one great job in Florida of returning, you know, the, the party to those traditional values, and it's shown in the in the in the uh, results. Not only the election results last week, but the outcomes in Florida. So, you know, fighting back against the wall culture, you know, d d during the COVID lockdowns, he he was brilliant, and so and he's liberated the economy. So the economy is is crushing it. So so I think on in on many measures. Ron DeSantis is a traditional conservative politician, and perhaps without some of the baggage of President Trump. But I think that the party could do a better job articulating what they are about. And I think, you know, because if you look at the, the Republican governors in Texas and Georgia, you know, throughout the Midwest, they, they did really well. The incumbents really did well this election. It's just becoming harder to, to beat an incumbent. You know, the only, I think of all the governors and senators running for reelection, only one lost, uh, one incumbent lost. So, I mean, these are things that, that I think the Republicans made a mistake in the midterms, not articulating their vision and their message better. They were just running on Biden's horrible and the Democrats are horrible, which might be true, but that's not really something, you know, a positive vision to run on. Whereas I think Ron DeSantis and several other Republican governors did run on that vision. So now the question is, can he translate that into a national message and get the party together? But I think one thing I would I'd clarify here is, you know, this is in 2016 where he had Trump running against the so-called establishment or the country club Republican Party of the, you know, Bush, Bush, McCain, Romney. This is this is now Trump running against other candidates that are a lot like him, yeah. many of whom yeah. 
actually worked for him. If you think about Mike Pompeo and Mike Pence yeah. and, and these yeah. Republican governors who supported Trump in many ways, Christy Noem, for example. So, you know, I think I think that this is a different election. 2016 yeah. was was, was yeah. a, a different kind of argument. Alan Lippmann, you've been fantastic at predicting uh, the presidential uh, elections. What about the primaries, the Republican primaries? Who do you think is going to end up representing uh, the Republicans? I don't think it's going to be Donald Trump. Uh, he has just too many legal problems. You know, there is so much smoke, I have to believe there is some fire, that he's going to be indicted for the mishandling of our most sensitive, top-secret uh, documents, for meddling in the Georgia presidential election, perhaps for trying to support fake electors and inciting a riot. He has all kinds of civil cases. There's just too much there for Donald Trump to be able to run for president successfully. It could well be Ron DeSantis. I wouldn't count him out. But I would warn everyone who's listening that success as a governor does not necessarily translate into success in the white heat of a presidential election campaign. You never know. Look what happened to successful governors uh, in 2016 on the Republican side, like John Kasich and uh, Jeb Bush. They just flamed out or on the Democratic side. Uh, Jay Inslee and earlier Howard come in. Dean. You got about thirty seconds. Go. Yeah, I mean, you have you have a good point, but I think also about you know Bill Clinton was a, a governor of a very small state and he did well in the election, and, and Ronald Reagan, of course, was governor of California. So you know, I've always felt governors long are time better. ago. Yeah, true. I, I agree with that. It shows my age, but um, but I think that that DeSantis, you know, is in a really great position right now. I think the other big issue to keep in mind, guys, is is how many people are running against Trump. If there's four or five candidates splitting the non-Trump vote, that actually benefits President Trump. And so if it's head-to-head -head DeSantis right. and, and Trump, that's right. a different story. So we'll see how many candidates throw their hats in the ring. Okay, Greg Swenson, Jan Halper-Hayes, and Alan Lickman, thank you so much. More to be said, but Great unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you, though. Well, uh, Alan Lickman will be staying with us, of course. Now, we've looked at the likely Republican candidates. Let's uh, turn to their opponents now, the Democrats. And as things stand, it uh, looks likely that Joe Biden will run again next year, even though he's about to turn 80. Two thirds of Americans in exit polls say that they don't think you should run for re-election. What is your message to them? And how does that factor into your final decision about whether or not to run for re-election? It doesn't. What's your message to them? To those two thirds of Americans- Watch me. Well, it certainly looks like you'll run again, but is that a good idea? Let's bring in our guest now. And Professor Alan Lickman is still with us. And we also have Titus Nichols, a law professor and staunch Democrat who believes Biden should definitely run again. Titus, welcome back to the program. And let's start with this. I mean, there have been some concerns, and we've heard about it even from the New York Times article uh, from a few months ago, that his officials, Biden's own officials, are a bit worried about his age. He's the oldest uh, president in US history, and yet you're keen for him to run for a second term. Why? And I think what you said kind of illustrates the point. The poll was from a few months ago, taken before we saw the results of the midterm elections, in which Republicans failed to accomplish the, what they called, red wave that they thought was going to happen. And you saw that Democrats performed a lot better than anybody expected. So you have that to show that, obviously, the public has faith in President Biden's capability. Otherwise, Democrats would have been absolutely slaughtered in the midterms. That doesn't change the fact that he's about to turn 80 years of age, and uh, by the time he finishes, he'll be 86. Well, let's talk about some of the things that this old man has been able to accomplish in just his first two years. There's the infrastructure bill, which President Trump's incompetent administration was never able to get through. There's the fact that now the government can negotiate for reduced prices for Medicare recipients, and there's also going to be the reduced price of insulin. Those are three significant facts that have been accomplished under President Biden's, Biden's tenure. So if anyone has questions about his, uh, if he's senile, whether he's incompetent to the job, just look at the track record for the past two years. Well, he's achieved quite a lot, uh, according to you, Titus, but I thought you were in favor of age caps for politicians. In general, there needs to be something that will allow younger people to, take, to be in position of leadership, such as within the House. There's talk about uh, Representative Hakeem Jeffries running to be the minority, to be the leader of the minority. In general, I think it's always good to try to get new blood in positions of set responsibility. Set the age cap, However, though. We're talking about the President of the United States. Titus, where would you set the age cap? Because it's really pushing it, isn't it? 
It really depends. Look how look how immature uh, Donald Trump acts. So it's really hard to find a magical number to say that this is the cutoff and this is where we expect people to go on yeah. with the rest of their lives. Look, I, I can tell this is uh, somewhat aggravating you that we're talking about Joe Biden's age, but to anybody around the world who watches him, uh, for example, at the, the COP conference, we do see him falling asleep at, at crucial times. And uh, it, it's not... It's not something we can ignore. It's, it's an elephant in the room and we have to address it. You think that he's uh, perfectly capable to carry on? I say, look, look at the past two years. What has he accomplished in the past two years that made this country stronger? It doesn't matter that he falls asleep look sometimes in, in the middle of a conference uh, with the cameras on him. I mean, heck, I've fallen asleep before in court before. Does you might fall asleep. I'm incapable of being a lawyer? You might fall asleep in the middle of this program. Actually, no, I'm only kidding. Uh, let's, get, let's talk about the midterms, uh, Titus. You said he's done very well. Um, and uh, historically, and the facts bear it out. The question is, um, why is it with inflation uh, as high as it is and uh, gas prices high and so on, and with that awful uh, Afghanistan withdrawal to his name, how did uh, the Democrats uh, do so well in relative terms uh, in the midterms? <laughs> It's very simple. The Republicans didn't have a better alternative. You can't just run on saying how horrible the other person is, but you don't have any solutions as to how to make things better. The Republicans did not have any solutions for how to reduce global inflation. The Republicans did not have any plan for how they would have handled Afghanistan different. What the voters saw was that the Democrats have been doing their best to try to address the problems that we have that really are quite unprecedented. Unprecedented. You do appreciate that his approval ratings are something like 41% and disapproval 53%? Which, with gas prices being the way they are, as well as inflation, it's not, a, it's not unheard of to see a president with such low numbers. However, you also see how his numbers are from the summer of 2022 up until the midterms. Uh, Professor Lickman, of course, uh, no matter his approval ratings, as an incumbent, uh, according to your system, and, and according to what we can observe for ourselves, he has a very big advantage, uh, well, the Democrat Party has a very big advantage if he runs again. That's absolutely correct. <clears throat> Look, I'm not a physician. I'm not going to comment on Biden's health and age. I'll just give you the hard politics. My system, the 13 keys to the White House, which has been right since I predicted Ronald Reagan's re-election in 1982 and was invited to the Reagan White House, is premised on the fact that it's the strength and performance of the party holding the White House that determines the outcome of elections. Of the 13 key factors, if six go against the party holding the White House, they are predicted losers. If Biden runs again, they secure the incumbency key and the internal party fight key. If he doesn't run, they lose the incumbency, they lose the internal party fight key because there's no obvious heir apparent. That puts them down two keys. Mm. That means they only need to have four more keys to fall to be predicted losers. Whereas if Biden does run, they need six more keys to fall. So ironically, Democratic success in 2024 largely turns on whether Joe Biden runs again. So forget all the conventional polling and punditry. They're wrong as much as they're right, of course, and they missed 2016 entirely. They missed uh, the lack of a Republican wave in 2022, and they falsely predicted that Democrats would gain House seats in 2020. And just to be clear, he hasn't said he's definitely going to run again. He's going to talk to his family and perhaps uh, give us a firm answer uh, before the end of the year. If he doesn't run, who else in the field could come forward? Well, it, it won't matter because there's no other key they lose the incumbency key. It's an open seat election. And look, the history of open seat elections has been very grim. Democrats in 2016, Republicans in 2008. I would say probably the top two contenders, the most obvious one is Kamala Harris, the vice president. But her approval ratings are, if anything, maybe even lower than Joe mm -hmm. Biden's. Perhaps uh, Buttigieg, the uh, transportation mm -hmm. Secretary, uh, Governor Newsom of California, who, like DeSantis, had a very big uh, win in his uh, re-election bid. 
and you may see some of the same folks who competed against Biden uh, last time, Senator Booker in New Jersey, Senator Yeah. Titus, really quickly, Gillibrand. a final answer for, for the show. If not Biden, then who for you? Well, I agree with the professor. The actual choice would be Vice President Kamala Harris, or you have uh, Secretary Buttigieg. The issue is that right now it's all just fantasy talk because there's nobody who is saying that they are going to take a run at President Biden. The party is firmly behind him, and there's no one within a leadership position saying that they're looking for somebody else. Sure. Well, it's up to him, though, isn't it? He hasn't yet declared. So, we'll see. Thank you so much, uh, Titus Nichols and Professor Alan Lickman. Thank you so much for your contributions to The Nexus today. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching. Remember, if you want to see this episode again or any of our previous episodes, do go to our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Until next week, then, goodbye.